Thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge Dennis and his counterpart, who's actually behind the screen, like Mr. Wizard, uh, Jill Sunderland. Um, Dennis and Jill work tirelessly at their real jobs and then facilitate all the lectures so that all of you have a chance to, to get exposure to Harbor Branch. All of the scientists here, you get to uh, learn about their research and you get to meet them, and that's a wonderful opportunity. And um, you know, he, Brian mentioned, uh, uh, Dennis mentioned Brian Cousin, who's a, an award-winning videographer, who always does such a wonderful job of, of taking on challenges and, and making us look good and uh, representing all of what we do at Harbor Branch to the general public, the audiences, and some special projects. I challenged him to get 10 years into three minutes, and I think he went just a few seconds over, but it's classical, it's a gas, and it's just a short three or four minutes to take a 10-year retrospective look at some of the things we've been doing with our marine mammal research and conservation program during that time. Jill? Thanks for that, Brian. That's awesome. Thank you. So that's just a quick snapshot. We've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. I want to stay on time and try and get through everything, and, and plus take some time afterwards to meet with you individually if you have questions. You know, we're looking at the past, we're in the present, and we're looking at the future, and a lot of what's happening in our oceans is changing. There's a new documentary, it'll be out this June. It's called Changing Seas. It's part of an ongoing story about many facets of what's going on in the oceans and how it impacts all life on this planet. And we're proud to be a part of that series. We've been contributing now for some time and um, uh, very soon the um, 
the documentary will be out. I thought I'd give you a quick teaser and a quick look at what's happening in the future with our changing seas. Jill? They are a Florida icon. Smart, agile, and playful. Dolphins have sparked the imaginations of many, and their undersea world might be linked with ours more than we know. Well, we look at the bottomless dolphins as very good sentinels of the health of the coastal ecosystem. Dolphins are a barometer. They're an apex predator in an environment that we all share. They're breathing the same air that we breathe. They're swimming through the same water in which we swim. They're eating the same fish that we catch. And granted, we're not in the water as much as they are, and we're not eating as many of the fish, but if problems were going to show up, we would expect them to show up in the dolphins first. For decades, toxic chemicals have made their way into the oceans, leaving fish and marine mammals vulnerable. Dolphins that have, have washed up in various places, including the southeast United States, they have to be treated as toxic waste. The levels of contaminants are so high. Some animals show disturbing signs of immune system dysfunction and disease, which may be linked to contaminant exposure. They're kind of like the 400-pound miner's canary. Um, these animals are telling us what's happening. We've used the oceans as our toilet for centuries, and now I think we're starting to see the effects of that through all these new health issues that are coming up. So if these dolphins here on our coastlines, these apex predators, they're getting sick, well, who's next? It's the humans. Thank you, Jill. So that's a glimpse of what's coming up. Um, we're a part of this, this program, this documentary, Changing Seas. And um, I'm going back to some beginnings here. And before I go any further, I had the opportunity to run into a special guest, a good dear friend and former managing director and president of Harbor Branch, who gave me my opportunity to become a part of this incredible institution and to contribute in so many ways. And uh, he's here tonight, and his name is Rick Herman. Rick, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Rick also told me that you know, he'd, uh, uh, he'd, he'd be very supportive of, of getting the specialty license plates. So again, getting the specialty license plates probably would not have ever happened had it not been for Rick encouraging and, and providing that that ability for us to go up there and get the job done. So with that, the IRL. In 1995, there were two dolphins uh, named Bogey and McCall, two female dolphins. They were caught in the Indian River Lagoon in 1988. They were one or two of the last four dolphins taken out of the Indian River Lagoon. And um, there was an effort to bring them back. This was pre-Free Willy. So uh, we were working to create protocols for taking uh, captive dolphins and trying to rehabilitate them and reintroduce them uh, into their native habitat. And it was a very interesting period of time and we learned a lot primarily from the dolphins. Here I'm treating a dolphin named Bogey, a female that's pregnant and she had an eye injury requiring uh, daily treatments which were very difficult to do living on a spoil island out here in the Indian River Lagoon. And uh, during that time, uh, working on the native reintroduction, we knew that more than 100 dolphins had been removed from the lagoon for uh, public display industry, but very little data existed on the population of dolphins, either the individuals or the population. It was either incomplete or out of date information. And so uh, once the dolphins were released and we began following them, uh, we recognized that there were many threats to dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon. We saw fisheries. We saw shark attacks, we saw fishing line entanglements, human interactions basically, as well as disease and uh, boat strikes. Uh, about 10% of the dolphin population actually shows evidence of, of boat trauma. 
Anthropogenic stressors or man-induced stressors, human interactions are at an increase with fishing line and crab pot uh, uh, lines and, and other forms of debris, including a fan belt that actually was removed from one of the dolphins that we intervened on. Another increasing threat and one of great concern to the National Marine Fisheries Services who manage uh, marine resources and dolphins in particular is depredation. People of fishermen feeding dolphins, either bait or disabled fish from their boat. At first it's fun, it may even be funny, but dolphins uh, learn from observing other dolphins and once they realize there's a free handout, they begin pestering the fishermen, they begin ingesting fishing lures that cause their death. So um, there's a big effort out now, an educational campaign about uh, not feeding wild dolphins. Mother Nature has a hand in threats to dolphins and to humans, natural disasters like the hurricanes that we experienced here and in Gulfport, Mississippi. Threats also include water quality. The disease on this animal is a fungal zoonotic known as lobomycosis. We'll talk about it in a minute. But water quality is something that all life on this planet depends on, good, clean water quality. And dolphins are no exception. Paralytic shellfish poisoning, neurologic shellfish poisoning, harmful algal blooms produce exactly that. They produce uh, uh, toxins in the water that are very prevalent, increasing here in the Indian River Lagoon, and detrimental to all forms of life, fish, plants, animals, and birds. And in 2001, and again in 2008, in Melbourne, Florida, in an area, um, there were two unusual mortality events. They're called UMEs. There's one perhaps brewing right now on the Atlantic coast where more than 15 dolphins have stranded in just the past week. So a UME is classified as a large number of animals dying in one area in a very short period of time. And uh, while the scientific um, decisions about what caused the UMEs is still debatable, uh, it is a fact that uh, 27 dolphins died uh, in the 2001 and 43 died in 2008 and died just in a four or five week period of time. And again, uh, we're looking at factors that would cause that. Again, uh, in 1997, uh, we brought the program to Harbor Branch. We went to Tallahassee with so many threats, we needed some funding and a good source of funding and we got it. We got a lot of support for the Protect Wild Dolphin Plate and it's uh, raised a, a, a great deal of uh, funding to, to continue our program. We brought the program to Harbor Branch, strategically located on the Indian River Lagoon, diverse with science and resources that would, uh, uh, just unimaginable. And it became our home, base of operations to continue building on. In 2003, went back to Tallahassee because sometimes we were working with whales and we couldn't use dolphin funding to work with whales, so we got a, a whale plate to specifically address more than 12 species of whales that inhabit, migrate, or utilize Florida waters or coastal areas. The legisla legislative mandates are fairly straightforward. Uh, collect, analyze, and archive, conduct population studies, uh, provide support and assistance, care and assistance to sick and injured dolphins, advance research technologies, and disseminate the information both in scientific, formal education, and as well public outreach in lectures such as this. Dolphins are essentially twofold. They're excellent barometers of environmental health because, as the video said, like the 400-pound canary in the coal mine, they're also that charismatic megafauna that get a lot of attention. Uh, while water, gra uh, water quality, seagrasses, and other forms of, of life and uh, aquatic uh, environment is very important. Dolphins sometimes can be the, uh, um, the, the focal point to bring attention on all those things that are interrelated. So dolphins essentially become sentinels of ocean and human health. That's what our program concept was built on. Population ecology is just one component of the uh, uh, marine Mammal Research and Conservation Program. And we conduct monthly photo ID surveys that include areas in the Mosquito Lagoon in the north, Banana River, and all the way in the south, the St. Lucie River Inlet. This is 40% of Florida's east coast. It's where the temperate zones from the north meet tropics from the south. More than 300 or 3,000 species of plants, animals, and birds, many rare and endangered, live in this very diverse uh, natural estuary, which is a huge economic engine 
uh, to this region and all the state of Florida. So it has huge economic impact and viability as well. Um, we look at stocks of dolphin in the Indian River Lagoon. We also look at stocks of dolphins offshore. In a two-year pilot study, I've identified 250 dolphins, and for the most part, the resident stock of dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon stay there. And the dolphins on the near coastal side are dolphins that, uh, that, that have residency in that area. Advancing technologies, we're using sophisticated GIS software technologies to spatially and temporally uh, make sense of all the sightings and the, the data that we take in. Uh, you can see here this individual dolphin has a sighting history that's localized in the northern area of the IRL, somewhere we call the end of the internet. If you ever wondered where that was, it's at the end of the IRL. In that region, that particular dolphin has strong site fidelity. So if that dolphin has a particular ailment, um, say he's loaded with mercury, you might look for some type of contamination uh, outflow in that area. If that dolphin became entangled in some kind of fishing line and I was requested to go catch him and remove the fishing line, I'd have a pretty good idea where to start looking at least because the lagoon's a pretty big area. Part of our population ecology research have shown that there are resident dolphins, but surprisingly there's three individual stocks um, or communities, let's call them. All one stock, but different communities. And uh, so you have north, middle, and lower end. And you'll see there's some overlap. So if there was a contagious disease, this could be catastrophic for these animals. They live in their specific regions. A UME might affect that one group, but if there is a contagious disease, it has a great potential to spread and spread rapidly. So population ecology, we're looking at the size, the number, the distribution, the seasonal influx, reproductive success, how they move around, their grand scale movement patterns. Um, you know, we're observing human interactions, recording vessel impacts, fisheries interactions. And um, in life history or our pathology lab, we see dolphins that have died. And unfortunately, we're seeing too many dolphins, an increasing number of dolphins dying in the IRL. So by looking at their cause of death uh, and determining how old they were, what sex they are, we're getting much more information than you would get by just taking a picture of them. Not always uh, um, possible to tell what sex a dolphin is unless it's a mother calf pair. Uh, it's not always easy to tell how old a dolphin is unless you analyze their teeth, like rings of a tree. They tell you how old the dolphin is. And, um, we found that in our first 17 stranded animals that most of them had some pretty serious diseases, skin disorders, infectious, viral, bacterial, zoonotic, uh, all kinds of infections in one area cause for concern. As I mentioned, mortality rates have increased and they continue to increase. If you look at this graph, you can see that the dolphin deaths in the IRL are going upwards. In 2008, it was over 100. And if the trend continues, 15 a month, will be way beyond that when we get to December 31st of this year. So uh, mortality rates of dolphins, again, sentinels of ocean and human health. And we're next at the top of the food chain. Another program component is our ability to provide uh, rescue and first response to stranded animals that wash ashore on our beaches, whether they be dolphins or whales. We're on call 24-7. We have uh, tremendous resources and dedicated staff, and we respond uh, not only in our area, sometimes out of our area. And uh, sometimes it's a single animal, sometimes it's a mother calf pair, sometimes they're alive, dead, sometimes they're mass stranded. So we rescue, rescue, rescue. They may see us out there from time to time, but we play an important role within the Southeast United States Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Network. And uh, we contribute to a larger group's efforts to, uh, to collect data uh, from each animal, which is a, essentially a treasure trove of scientific information. We provide triage and critical care within our uh, marine mammal stranding facilities. And in this environment, we also have excellent teaching opportunities for those new emerging marine mammal veterinarians, people who are looking into conservation medicine. Uh, this is an exciting uh, opportunity and one of a kind opportunity where people can actually get hands on this is a real quick story about a little dolphin named Winter. Maybe some of you have heard about her. Has anybody heard about Winter, the dolphin? She stranded in the northern IRL. Her tail fluke was caught up in a crab pot, and she 
lost restricted blood flow. Ischemic necrosis is the $10 word. And her tail fluke fell off. So a lot of us came together to help the folks out at Clearwater after we took her there. We stayed with them. Our veterinarian, Dr. Julie Goldstein, worked with their veterinarians uh, to uh, help on a research committee develop a prosthetic tail fluke. But how to attach it was the big problem, and, and uh, there were a lot of other challenges. Well, the technology that Hanger Prosthetics has developed has now been a tremendous benefit to returning combat veterans of Iraq who can now wear a prosthetic device manufactured for a dolphin, but the technology is, uh, provides more comfort, and uh, so uh, amputees can, can have a prosthetic device that actually isn't so uncomfortable, and they can keep it on longer and lead a more productive and normal life. There's also a story of a little girl who came in. She had uh, had her leg uh, removed after a, a lawnmower ran over her. She was nine years old. So you can imagine how her parents felt and how she was just crushed. She, she was just completely inconsolable. Well, the Shriners Hospital brought her to Clearwater Aquarium. She met Winter and within 30 minutes was transformed. She's now at a very young age, uh, fully funded by Shriners. She's going to go and become a neurologic uh, prosthetic specialist and she's going to work in pediatrics uh, to help children, other children who've lost limbs. So she went from being totally depressed and withdrawn to, to seeking a higher education at a young age. And she's on fire. So um, dolphins do have the power to change. We're looking uh, at idiopathic diseases. In particular, Dr. Goldstein is uh, looking at cardiomyopathy, uh, a condition that exists in humans. It exists in whales. And what's causing it is alarming. The Coja breviceps, or pygmy sperm whale, is the second most frequently stranded dolph uh, marine mammal next to bottlenose dolphins. We've published a uh, very uh, useful Koja heart dissection manual. If you have any Kojas wash up in your backyard, this allows other scientists to collect the data as we would collect it so we can collectively look at a standardized approach to evaluating this disease. In our efforts to rescue and rehabilitate marine mammals, the end goal is to release them to the wild. And here, we're making a native reintroduction of a few dolphins offshore. They were tagged by satellite and VHF. Uh, Post-release monitoring uh, is always an important part of rehabilitation efforts to ensure that the animals actually survived. And in this case, many months later, courtesy of Moat Marine Laboratories, this tracking uh, diagram shows uh, not only where they went, but when they went. And uh, uh, it, it provides a lot of useful information that would normally not be available kind of hard to go following dolphins around out in the open ocean for a long period of time. Over a period of time, we've developed a tremendous amount of, of resources and equipment, supplies, experience, and these resources are often called upon uh, in, in many instances throughout the southeast region. In some cases, I'm going to show you a few pictures of dolphins that have become entangled in fishing gear, and I'm called to lead multi-agency efforts in uh, responding to locating the dolphin, catching the dolphin, uh, along with Dr. Goldstein and other veterinarians providing an assessment, evaluation, treatment in the field and releasing. This little dolphin here was well known to us and our photo ID team uh, ID'd it and brought it to our attention. It's a crab pot made out of inner tube and this uh, dolphin over here in the lower uh, left hand corner that you'll see is actually the mom. And when we took her out of the water and treated her, they weren't communicating. So mom took off. We put a boat on her. She went about a, almost a mile away. As soon as we put the little baby back in to get ready to release him, the radio crackled. And uh, we were told the mother was heading back full, full, full steam. And we better look out, because she didn't look like she was very happy. She was coming back for her kid. And uh, she stopped right out there in front of us. We let her go. They saddled up and, and took off with a look back. And the nicest part about it, it was Mother's Day. Yeah. Sometimes just things just happen, you know. Anthropogenic trauma. Here in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a dolphin in Savannah, Georgia. This dolphin had the same kind of homemade inner tube uh, crab pot door closure around his neck for more than a year. We were able to successfully capture the dolphin, release him, and uh, continue to observe him. But the important take-home here 
we were able to find out what that gear is, where it came from, and make sure that uh, it's out of the environment so it's no longer uh, available uh, as it used to be. 911 emergency transports, we have a state-of-the-art marine mammal ambulance that gets us uh, all around to help others out, rescue and respond to stranded animals. Uh, in the case of Hurricane Katrina in Savannah, Georgia, we work interagency across the board with everybody that's involved in stranding efforts statewide. A good example is after Hurricane Katrina destroyed uh, this facility in Gulfport, Mississippi, a 40-foot tidal surge came over the pools that are only 20 feet deep. The eight dolphins inside were washed out to sea. Bloodied, battered, bruised, confused, these animals were being set on by wild sharks, uh, predating on them. There were uh, 250,000 Purdue chicken carcasses floating in the water from a container ship that spilled over. It was nasty and it was hot and there was no running water. I mean, the, the whole area, you can see, was destroyed. We spent several weeks and, and one by one we caught seven of the eight dolphin. And as we exhausted all our efforts and were headed home, somebody called in. They had a dolphin almost 100 miles away. It was the last of the eight dolphin. Uh, actually, two, two of the dolphin were remaining. So we caught six. Two were remaining. We were able to go down worked with a multi-agency team to rescue the final two, brought them all back to uh, uh, a stabilization facility. They're now residing in uh, Atlantis in the Bahamas. They've got a great home and a great uh, captive uh, breeding program, and uh, they're doing a lot better than they were in the previous conditions. Recently, I was called to go out and help a little dolphin named Mohawk in Texas. Julie and I went out with a, a rag bunch of team members that the Texas Marine Mammal Stranding Network had pulled together. Um, we didn't have all the resources we needed and we were in uh, the Brownsville Shipping Channel. Anybody been there? Don't bother. It's a long place, a lot of shrimp boats, dragon nets, and uh, 60 feet deep and our nets are only 16, 18, 20 feet deep. But we were able to successfully rescue the dolphin named Mohawk for an earlier injury which kind of gave him that scalped appearance on his uh, rostrum. So we removed the fishing gear, Julie gave him a once over, and the neat part about this job is we get great dolphin shows. Because right after we released these two dolphins, who had been limping around, snagged up in this fishing gear, uh, trying to make their way in forage, they were out on one of the passing shrimpers, and they were completely out of the water, just uh, together and, and uh, uh, jumping ahead of the ship. So it was a good, good thing to see. I'm going to show you a video in a little bit. This is an interesting case here. Port Arthur, uh, Clam Lake, freshwater lake, three miles inshore. Hurricane Ike uh, took a dolphin and gave him probably the best surfing ride of all. Three miles inland and deposited him in a freshwater lake where nobody goes. Nobody fishes there. Sketchy reports for a year. The Loch Ness dolphin scooting around there. Nobody knew what it was. They'd see this fin lurking. and. That's a dolphin. It's got white all over it. So uh, on our way home from uh, um, uh, Texas here in the Brownsville Shipping Channel, they said, see if there's anything there. If there is, catch it and take it home. So uh, we got together uh, the Texas Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Some great people out there, too. They do there what we're doing here in some respects. We caught the dolphin. We drove him three miles. We took him back to the beach, and he was jumping for joy. He was out the channel there. So. Sometimes things don't go right. This is a dolphin named Dunham. He's stranded near Clearwater December of 2008 and seven months of rehabilitation at Gulf World up in the Panhandle. National Marine Fisheries Service called and said they'd like me to transport the dolphin to the release site, release him, supervise the release, and do some post-release monitoring. Unfortunately, three hours after a very good release, there were two tiger sharks. One of them was 11 feet long that hit him. and. Um, it was uh, one of those things that you're watching nature at its most terrific moment. I dove in the water to try and save the dolphin. You can see in the lower right, and uh, it was too late. Uh, this is one case where we learn from this uh, particular uh, release effort that uh, uh, we need to pay particular attention to predators in the area the time of year. So we learned a very valuable lesson in a, in a unique situation. This dolphin in Jacksonville, was in fresh water, he was out of habitat, 
And uh, nobody knew what to make of him. He was so bizarre. His skin, as you can see, is all mottled and flaking, and, and he just had this strange appearance. Uh, he was uh, in fresh water for too long. We were able to rescue him, but unfortunately, we weren't able to say that this animal could be a candidate for rehabilitative efforts. We have limited money, limited opportunities to, to apply our resources. We want to make sure those animals have the best chance of survival and a return to the wild. A bad day, probably the worst that any veterinarian has to face, is to make the call. And Julie made the call that this animal needed to be euthanized humanely. And um, uh, during the process, it expired. So. Um, it was just weak. But you can see the scoliosis. You see the curvature of the spine. That was due to uh, what we suspect might be earlier trauma. It actually had fractures in the necropsy. Hey, every once in a while, we're in Florida, we get a surprise, like a couple of Arctic seals. Actually, three of them. A couple of hooded seals, and in the lower left, a bearded seal. Again, we were able to apply our resources, experience, and talent. And with the help of a real good friend who has a Learjet, uh, we reconfigured the jet jumped on board, took off for those folks up there who really know how to manage the seals, and that's the Brigantine Marine Mammal Stranding Network, Bob Sholkoff and his group. They have a special rehabilitation area. And look at this little fat seal here on the bottom. I think there's about 185 pound weight gain. And uh, you can see the beard on the seal. Uh, several months later, with the National Marine Fisheries Service approval tag, this seal was released and has been cited and recited many times, living and doing what seals do out uh, on the rookeries. All of you are aware of the recent cold snap we had, and you can not only see all the dead fish in the lagoon, you can probably still smell them too. And the cold stress syndrome takes a horrible effect on fish, plants, animals, and manatees, and sea turtles. Recently, we were called on to help with some manatee rescues here in the upper right, doing some medical field examinations, uh, these are beautiful animals, but they live in temperate and they depend on warm water. When it's less than 68 degrees for an extended period of time, they go into a metabolic malfunction and a meltdown occurs. So the water may get real cold, the manatees get immune compromised, all these symptoms, regardless of age or sex, start taking place, and the next thing you know, three or four weeks later, it's nice and warm, we're walking around in our summer wear, but the manatees are worse for wear, and the animals, um, unfortunately, do not respond uh, always. And uh, uh, just in a few weeks uh, past, more than 133 manatees have died as a result of cold stress syndrome and a newly defined disorder, cold stress shock, because the water got so cold so fast. And uh, you can see the effects of this anthropogenic cold stress syndrome identified by Bossert et al. Loss of that warm water habitat, they gather around those uh, power uh, plants that put out the warm water effluents. And um, their other worst enemy, boat strikes, boat trauma. And I thought I would put the slide up here just to illustrate how horrible it is. Uh, these carcasses were covered by FWC and other managing agencies. Uh, idle speed, no wake. Go slow if you're in a manatee zone. Sea turtles, a few weeks before the manatee fiasco, uh, still pending. Uh, 4,100 sea turtles washed up all around Florida's coastlines. 4,100 sea turtles. Uh, there was a mass effort by everybody that could mobilize. Every agency, every organization contributed. It was an incredible effort. Uh, there weren't a lot of resources uh, to, to rehabilitate turtles, so they ended up in warehouses, stacked on floors, being processed, and separating the dead and the dying from the living. It was really an incredible effort by a lot of good people. Uh, including folks at uh, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, the Port St. Lucie, Juno Beach, Gumbo Limbo. Um, here you can see the turtles being uh, um, identified. And, and here at uh, our ORA facility, uh, many of the sea turtles found a few days of warm water respite, enough to get them invigorated so that we could affect the release of more than 400 sea turtles. So we, we dealt with about a tenth of this uh, uh, number of animals that stranded. Uh, a, 20% mortality rate, so a lot of turtles getting out, and it sure does feel good to help out something and, and get him back out there. Uh, our education is another program component, and we go from the very young to everybody, uh, including uh, our legislators, very important. 
Our marine mammal medicine and biology courses in BioVet, MarVet, we're getting the formal education to those people that are, that are looking for opportunities to get education in marine mammals that's not otherwise available. We make formal presentations and have a global audience presenting around the world from China, uh, Canada, uh, Germany, Spain, and, and here across throughout the United States. And we've conducted hundreds of lectures in the past decade at numerous organizations to reach people like yourselves that don't make it to Harbor Branch. We have international conservation. We're doing manatee health assessments outside of uh, the United States and sharing our techniques with others. Uh, we're hosting International Serenian Conference at the Georgia Aquarium in 2009 and had a, a, a tremendous global audience, uh, really a great exchange of information. We put out posters, we fund PSAs, all to get messages out uh, about protecting dolphins and the laws governing their protection and our responsibility to do that. We also have a stranding reimbursement fund, so money from the plates goes out to help other people who are trying to do the same things that we're doing. Uh, we've also had a competitive grant award program. More, almost $3 million have gone out to fund numerous of other scientists. Hundreds of publications and presentations have come as a result, and uh, some students have benefited. From our whale plate, we're providing external funding to look at population studies, that show us the grand scale movement of the most endangered of all whale species, the northern right whale. Only about 300 of these amazing animals live, uh, are, are left surviving. They inhabit an area um, from Maine all the way down to Vero Beach and a little bit beyond. With this cooler weather, we're seeing them go even further south, even earlier in the year because of the colder water. Again, quite a, an unusual event. But um, these animals, have their calving and mating grounds in Jacksonville and around that area. So every winter they're down there. And uh, so surveys, aerial boat-based surveys, looking at their distribution, their numbers, they're easily identifiable. Uh, the numbers of calves, reproductive success. Uh, we get good data from that and our partners with Marine Land Conservation and Marine Resource Council. And sometimes we're providing early warning so we can tell the big ships that need miles to slow down that there's a whale up ahead and they need to divert their, their course. And sometimes the information we obtain helps in interventions, disentangling these large animals. And of course, uh, the kids are always a ready resource, uh, very interested in whales and conservation. Sound technologies or our acoustic capabilities combined with aerial surveys are a real key for management resource managers uh, who have to protect the species. And all of this is kind of like an emerging disease and environmental distress syndrome because what we're seeing here, we're seeing worldwide. Our health and environmental risk assessment was based on the premise, again, dolphins as sentinels of ocean and human health. They enable resource managers to develop new models and evaluate current strategies like the Conservation Everglades Restoration Plan. How do you gauge the effectiveness of putting billions of dollars in a restoration effort unless you have some way of measuring the results? Well, when we saw that dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon had these very disturbing skin disorders, some of which are zoonotic or contagious to people and vice versa, we started the HERA program and again we're looking up north, we're looking in the central region where the UMEs took place and in the south region where the majority of disease is, is seen. Uh, 60 people, uh, 80 people on any given day, as many as 12 boats. It's a huge two-week operation, again, looking to uh, uh, have a, a look at variety of different uh, infectious, viral, bacterial diseases, and developing links of those diseases to environmental distress stressors that, that affect the lagoon that we all share. The process I'll go through very quickly. We capture the dolphin in a net. We target the individuals, we know who we want selectively, we go out and we safely set on these animals. We don't set on mother calf pairs, we don't set on pregnant animals, we don't set on little babies or animals that can't handle stress, but we set on those animals and uh, very quickly they're brought into a stretcher, they relax. There's always a vet close by with emergency drugs. They're brought to the processing boat. At that time they're bled, so we get good blood chemistry on the animals. They're brought aboard a specially designed uh, research platform 
uh, the weight measured, photographed. We begin a, about a 40-minute physical examination that takes place very quickly. We sample about 170 data points, and we're always mentoring, uh, monitoring their temperature, pulse, and respiration rate. So just 170 sampling uh, data points, blood, urine, feces, blowhole cytologies, eye examinations, you name it, we do it. And all of this information is like a mini Mayo Clinic exam. The samples are immediately handed off to a boat rafted next to us called the laboratory or processing boat. The animals are marked, tagged, and released and followed to make sure that they're doing fine. And the results, disturbing. Infectious, viral, bacterial, all of these diseases, idiopathic, neoplastic cancer diseases, all in one area, like papillomavirus, genital, oral genital lesions in, in the mouth and the genital region. Uh, dolphins don't have hands, so they're very promiscuous. Um, and, and they interact with each other uh, with their mouths and uh, a lot of the times. The increase of the disease is disturbing. Um, viral, like dolphin pox, majority of all the dolphins have this indicator of stress, dolphin pox. Their gastric systems are under stress, very acidic. Um, and bacterial diseases, fungal zoonotics, like lobomycosis that only occurs in people and dolphins. Uh, these skin lesions are st studied in, in great detail. And papillomavirus, as in humans, can lead to cervical cancer in women, and it also can produce squamous cell carcinoma, and we're seeing some of that in the dolphins as well. We develop body scoring techniques, so photographically we could tell if a dolphin is maybe in need of some more help than just photographing it. And we see all kinds of unusual things, broken jaws, uh, dislocated jaws, uh, uh, gingivitis, shark bites. G did you know that 32% of dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon show evidence of shark interaction? Did you know that the IRL was the world's largest bull shark fishery? Did you know that there's tiger sharks in the Indian River Lagoon. 32% of more than 1,000 dolphins show interactions. Stingray barbs, this in the melon of the uh, dolphin. And so a whole potential of emerging diseases that we're looking at in our health assessment has identified that the most histologically confirmed cases of disease, no big surprise here for some of you maybe, coming out of Lake Okeechobee in an area that's agriculturally rich with cattle farming and, and orange groves and, and uh, chicken farming, as, as well as a lot of population and an overflow of septic tanks. So dolphins uh, from our studies have shown to be resistant to a lot of antibiotics that, that we humans take. And that's got uh, potential for uh, impact to human health as well. 61 publications in just uh, a few short years, less than a decade, more than 40 of them having to do with health of dolphin in the Indian River Lagoon. And considering the small size of our staff, this is really a monumental achievement. And next steps, um, we're looking at molecular genetics. We're looking at uh, mitochondrial DNA to determine who's related and who's not. And we're looking at uh, molecular uh, genetics to uh, better define. Maybe some dolphins have a gene, a gene that makes them resistant to some of these diseases. Um, and we're looking at epidemiology, which is the study in, uh, of the distribution and determination of disease. And um, we're realizing that there is that risk to humans as well as animals. Um, uh, as an example, mercury. In the Indian River dolphin, you can see here is higher than any other area. More dolphins and, and a greater percentage of mercury, 14 times higher than what the EPA would allow for human consumption or consider safe for human consumption. So the dolphins are eating the same fish that people catch and consume out of the Indian River Lagoon. Cause for concern? Um, and the scientific relevance is that these mercury especially is a um, persistent health threats, and uh, uh, they all reflect uh, you know, the same system that we all share. Well, you remember 2004 wasn't a good year for hurricanes. Francis and Jean uh, took our facilities on the left and totally trashed them. Uh, we re rebuilt our necropsy laboratory relatively quickly, but it's taken some time to get our Marine Mammal Critical Care and Triage Center back up and running the former home of J. Seward Johnson. 
and an end goal of creating a marine mammal teaching hospital that would be a unique facility to pass on what we're learning today and what we'll know tomorrow to the next generations of uh, veterinary practitioners. A long list of scientific collaborators, and this is a key fact. The marine park industry, these folks work with captive dolphins and marine mammals, and they're very good at what they do. They interact with millions of people every year, and the goal here was to utilize their expertise, their interest, bring them out into the field and let them gain the knowledge and the experience of wild dolphins and what we're learning and share that with all those people that come into the marine parks. Partnerships with Guy Harvey, Cousteau's, uh, Nova University, the Weiland Foundation, and too many acknowledgments um, to really go into because I have a few videos left here. But the success of our program isn't the result of any one person, it's a result of a team effort. And we have a very small, mighty team. And we've had a lot of support from good folks like you and everybody who've bought specialty license plates. That's the key to doing any good science and maintaining the momentum is having a consistent source of funding that you can count on. So thanks for now. And uh, Jill, are you ready back there? I'm going to show you a, a quick little video about a dolphin um, that we rescued off of Sunshine Key. And this is a dolphin, this is kind of taking you out on a dolphin rescue. Uh, and this is about a five minute video here, just to show you quickly. This dolphin was displaced after Hurricane Wilma and was in a, a tight pocket, uh, losing weight, showing signs of distress, and all the residents were calling and, and wanting somebody to do something. So again, this was an effort that required the coordination of a lot of different people, agencies, and organizations. And uh, like any fire department or any 911, the quicker we respond, the better the chance of survival. So we roll out and long drive down to Sunshine Key, immediately get our resources and um, assets in the water, align everything up. It's a Navy mat we use as a floating platform, and there's the, the site, pretty expansive area, small group of folks, and uh, try to get everybody together and dial them in so they can have a general idea of what we're trying to accomplish. So by working together, we develop a plan and how to mitigate the chances that any one person would get hurt or the dolphin. In this particular area, we had uh, uh, a very heavy current. You'll see in a minute, the current was very strong and there was a lot of seagrass in it. And uh, that's when you put a net out that's 18 foot deep and it starts filling up with seagrass, it'll sink the float lines. Dolphin can just swim over it. Or dolphin could hit the net and you wouldn't know it because you wouldn't see the float lines. So these are high risk interventions, not only for us, but for the dolphin. We get a final sighting on him and we're gonna make a set, that's the most anxious time, and then the net's out. This first attempt was unsuccessful. The dolphin, very quick, very smart, they see with sound, they have sonar. The dolphin just quickly beat the compass going out and uh, we stopped about halfway because that net's about 400 yards long and if you've ever stood on the transom and pulled the net and shaken about a ton of seagrass out of it, um, it takes a while. So with the net reloaded back on the boat, and now the dolphin being net-wise, he's up to our game. He's headed for an area on the ocean side, out of his habitat range, and we don't want him to go there. So we use the talent and resources we have to, to get in tight and uh, try to direct the dolphin's movement to that area where we can manage him and safely acquire him. So we get him in position, and the net goes out again. This time, this is a, a good old fishing trick here. We pull the net on the inside, and we run another compass around him, or another net around him. So we can shrink that compass and manage him. And uh, it's hard to tell if he's in there, float lines down, but he's in there. And now we're going to try and shrink that, that circle where we can get him.
this is the tricky part. Sometimes in trying to get him, they come out of the net, and if they get out of the net, you'll never get them back in the net. They're very smart, and they don't repeat too many mistakes too often. Once he's secured, we're real concerned these dolphins can go into shock, so you have to take a lot of care. And then you kind of calm down. He's safely acquired, he's on the Navy mat. The net's gonna be pulled back in immediately so it doesn't entangle any other marine life. Could be in the area. We tow the dolphin into shallow water where we can uh, set up and get some shade and water on him. We got an audience. No shortage of audience there. Good chance to interact with those folks and some of them getting umbrellas and sandwiches and mouth examination, blowhole cytology, just like our health assessment. We're collecting invaluable information on this animal who, by the way, has a known sighting history in the Florida Keys. There's a photo ID team down there, so we knew where this dolphin was from, and he was oh, about 40 miles from where he needed to be in this little shallow pocket. Blood samples. There's a shark bite for you, and a lucky dolphin to get away from a large bull shark. There's that shade umbrella. So with a clean bill of health, he's tagged for monitoring, post-release monitoring. There's no radio tag needed because he's in an area where there's a photo ID team that, that has access to him. The next step is to get him 40 miles out to home without him going into shock or crashing. So again, moving very quickly, all this takes place in, in less than about 15, 20 minutes. He's loaded aboard the, uh, the catch boat on a foam pad. We have secondary chase boats, so if the primary uh, transport boat breaks down, we can move him over to another boat. We've got a good team of folks there from a lot of different air areas, and uh, we get out offshore. Make the old dolphin taco in the foam pad. and he's back home just that quick. A big breath of air, and he rolls out of the stretcher, and uh, now we can pack up and clean and go home. Now for many of you here, you remember a dolphin named Lazarus. Jill, just keep it running, and I'll just keep talking because I want to try and keep this on time. Um, and a little dolphin named Lazarus, and some of you may remember Lazarus. A dolphin, baby dolphin, just a few, just about three or four weeks old, up in the northern IRL, we got a call from the Coast Guard and they nicknamed him Mayday, Mayday. He was uh, 140 miles north of here. At the time we got up there and got a boat out to the island, we were able to bring him back to Harbor Branch. And uh, you'll see what happens here. And we're gonna show you our, our stranding center. So this is a trip to our new stranding center. When the dolphin arrived, um, we were waiting to get him in the water and uh, he started crashing, going into shock. He had just hit the end of his threshold. These are basically what you're watching as a baby dolphin in death rows. At this point, What's his interesting is he filling up the fluid. develops pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the lung, actually most probably from uh, acute shock. You can hear the lungs from the bottom filling up to the top. It's kind of like a glass of water. As you add more and more water, the fluid level rises until you get to the top, and then essentially you can't breathe anymore because you're, you're uh, drowning in your own fluids. He's going rigid, he's arching. When he came in, he was the guy. We gave him methylprednisolone, which is an anti-shock drug that acts very quickly and, and allows the fluid to be drained off really rapidly. So the same drug that we give humans in the, in the hospital to drain that fluid out of the pulmonary edema, and he lived. So we called him Lazarus. And right away, he took a liking to, he had a strong suckling reflex, and I guess his mom had been gone for a while because he started suckling on Paul Shorts. <laughs> Paul, stop that. 
but we're recognizing a strong suckling advantage and, and uh, we want to take advantage of that right away. So the first line of defense is get some fluids on board to rehydrate the little baby dolphin. He's crying for his mother. It's, a, it's, a, it's drama and tragedy and, and a lot of energy and effort going into this whole thing. We put up our cots because they're going to be there a while. In fact, about 18 months uh, through the rehabilitation and weaning phase. So gradually he started responding. Medically, we needed to further evaluate his blood work and get some weights on him. And we started conditioning him, because he liked that water bottle, uh, and to, uh, to come over to us. And we betray his trust every once in a while, but it was for a good reason. We had to get weight on him, because when we're providing for those nutritional needs, the weight determines that. And then we only want to put about a half pound of weight on him a day. If you overload him with too many kcals, uh, they, they get saturated and they just stop eating and, and that's not what you want. You want them to continue eating and gain weight at small increments. There's our old stranding center, uh, blown away by the hurricanes, but now Lazarus is picking up some speed and like any baby dolphin, watch how smart he is. He's coming to a station when he's called. He's going to take his formula here. Get a nice little rub down and he's going to do A's to B's. So he's swimming from one point to another. A lot of positive reinforcement going into that. Then Seward Johnson left uh, one afternoon. He was here visiting. We called Rick up and, well, we drained the fresh water out of the pool and filled it up with salt water. We figured Seward wouldn't mind. And, uh, we took Lazarus over to let him stretch his legs a little bit and continue his development. He found great amusement in the crabs that would sometimes fall in the pool and continue his education. Here Mark Simmons, one of our top animal care experts at the time, was uh, calling him over to station, asking him to discriminate and come up just a little bit more, right there. There's the bridge. So his reinforcement is delivered and the, the whistle, he correlates what he was doing at the time I heard the whistle is what he's being rewarded for. A little balancing, stationary movement, all of these behaviors designed so we don't have to wrestle him and put him on the scale. We can uh, have him volunteer to be weighed, to volunteer for blood. And uh, there's playtime. Environmental enrichment tools or toys as they're also known. And Lazarus was thrilled with all of his toys. Boundless amount of energy and, and uh, never cease to amaze us. He's a very creative spirit and uh, just his goodwill there. He's very fast. All right, well, then you gotta make the formula. Here's how you make a dolphin milkshake. A Little bit of this, a little bit of that, some secret ingredients. Don't forget to blend twice. Oh, don't forget the fish. Yep, oh, through the strainer and there you go. Oh, he'd take about 350 milliliter bag like that in about three seconds, just suck it right down. There he goes. Gone. You know, when he was young, we used to pick him up and toss him around and he got a little bigger and we'd try to pick him up and toss him around and oh, it got harder. You know, dolphins are very social animals. They depend on one another, conspecifics. And uh, so we spent a lot of time trying to be the best uh, parents and uh, substitute parents that we could be. Here's a critical phase. When you take him off the bottle and give him his first piece of fish, uh, there's 88 needle conical sh sharp teeth there. And uh, uh, you want to make sure he gets that first fish because if he doesn't, it'll leave a bad taste in his mouth and he may not want to voluntarily eat solid food. He loved to get thrown around, but again, he got a little bit too big for that game, so we, we tried to keep up with him. He figured out where the fish bucket was. Now we're going to start working on advancing some medical behaviors. He's a little clumsy at first. Blowhole, these are medical behaviors. He's trained to, instead of sticking a Q-tip down there, you just have him blow in a Petri dish. Uh, he's got a problem with his uh, uh, mouth. You want to make sure you can look in the mouth and treat him. Want to give him an eye exam? No problem. 
He'll hold steady for you. He won't spook when you put the light in his eyes, volunteer for blood, or ultrasound examinations. Here you go. Very responsive to visual and sound hand cues, and very fast. I used to swim like that. Remember when we used to pick him up and he'd struggle and fight and we'd have to keep him on the scale and it'd be bouncing all around? Much easier just to train him to come up. Our new stranding center will have an advanced life support systems because dolphins live in the same environment, uh, a lot of bio waste with urine and feces. So we're monitoring water quality, we're monitoring behavior, food intake, and there's so much data to keep sensitive to all. We, uh, we use a sophisticated database. And here's Dr. Goldstein, first a volunteer, then a, a postdoc, and then uh, now the clinical staff veterinarian here, uh, getting an introduction and, and ultrasounding um, Lazarus. These are valuable teaching opportunities where somebody like Julie had the opportunity to learn and interact with the dolphin. We have the same opportunity with our stranding center back to, to bring up uh, that next generation. Unfortunately, the National Marine Fisheries Service has directed Lazarus to go to SeaWorld he um, drowned uh, when he became wedged in a corner of their feeding pool. And, uh, but still, he left a legacy, and uh, we've learned a lot from that. Hey, and don't feed wild dolphins. Here's a little video that we funded. It's 30 seconds. Oh. That's not the PSA. That's Lazarus again. He just had to have the last word. And again, his spirit and his inspiration lives on. A brief PSA, again, one of those ma major threats to dolphin. For me, it started with one hit of sardines. Oh, sardines. That's where I learned to bag. And it was easy to score free fish. I mean, hey, with this dolphin smile, yeah, it's illegal, but I, no one cares. I had a monkey on my back, but I was Jones for people food. Hanging out under boats, dodging props and hooks, and doing dangerous stuff, stuff that uh, I'm ashamed to admit. Look, I know that I can kick this if people would just stop feeding me. So help us protect wild dolphins. Don't feed wild dolphins. Thank you for coming out to see us tonight. Thank you for supporting Harbor Branch. And uh, thank you very much.